All right. All right. Well, we're going to get started here. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, I can see it. Everybody let me know if you can see the uh, see Nicole's screen. Type down in the chat box below. I might do this just yep. as long as you can't see too much cleavage. <laughs> cool. Yeah, everybody's seeing it. You're all good. Okay, all good. All right. You guys gave me one of the best introduction I've ever had. I, it was probably why the internet crashed. As I it was too embarrassed. Um, so yeah, what I discover, um, you know, working in different environments, you know, we work from, you know, dry land to, you know, super, super hydrated, wet landscapes. Um, pretty much every sector you can imagine, you know, we have bison producers and dairy and cropping and horticultural, um, you know, from pip fruit to avocados to market gardens. So you name it, uh, we've probably been involved with it. Um, my background actually in 1999, um, I finished my degree in ecology and um, my father purchased a property and we went about um, restoring wetlands and planting avocados. We planted 700 avocado trees. Um, and so that's kind of how I started was more in horticulture. Um, we did an amazing job actually with that wetland restoration in terms of um, we planted, I think, three and a half thousand trees and fenced off riparian zones. And what was interesting is, number one, there's a bird called a pukeko in New Zealand, and it came along and pulled most of those trees out. So we had to replant them. And then um, all this like gorse, which is um, so those of you in England probably know it. So thank you for gorse, um, the spiky um, legume shrub with this big thorns and blackberry came in and a couple of other things and the whole thing grew over and we were like well that was a waste of time well you can go to that property now and it's a standing forest like the whole thing just filled out and it was just extraordinary in terms of you know if we just kind of let nature do its thing um it wanted to be a forest and, and that's kind of where it went so that's just a little bit in a nutshell <sighs> Um, so yeah, uh, I think, you know, dealing with water pressures, are we, are we really thinking about how water moves through landscape in a holistic term, you know, and we're seeing, you know, increasing, um, I guess, legislative pressure thinking about uh, things like riparian planting or thinking about swales and, uh, you know, a lot of this um, mechanical thinking is important you know i'm not, not saying we do these things but for me if we want to get to the root roots cause sorry of erosion or sedimentation or runoff then we need to be looking at what is it that actually holds soils together and not just thinking about what is the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff you know um and just you know excluding animals or having that kind of thinking how do we think in whole systems and there's a really good image and i think this came from the soil food web you seen it Rolly? um uh, yeah, anyway, it's yeah. absolutely brilliant. Yeah, one of her, one of her slides. It's a good one. It's like the cave. They, yeah, it's that in the cave analogy. Yeah, it, it's it's absolutely brilliant. So if you look in the top right, that is um, a root with the root hairs of the little spikes you can kind of see coming off, and then what's coming out of that root here is our mycorrhizal fungi. So they are much, much finer and grow much, much further than our root hairs, and they are actually able to get inside those root those um, soil aggregates or the crumbs so you see those blocky bits that's our soil um, aggregates and then see down the bottom like some of these small aggregates have all been stuck together so this is the role of bacteria and fungi so think of them like building an apartment building is the the bacteria kind of stick together and start making the bricks and then it's the fungi that hold those bricks together start to they exude different types of um, glues and amino acid substances and these biofilms. So I kind of think a little bit like a biofilm is you've got like a skittle sitting there surrounded by a jello and it's that jello that's being released by microbiology that create all these glues and waxes and and some of it is actually vomit and spit and like all of the byproducts of microbiology like it's quite disgusting down there and that's what helps stick that soil together and then you've got your worms coming through and your macro arthropods and all sorts of stuff that are building that structural design okay so what's really holding a soil together is not roots um 
It's actually microbiology. And so I love this slide and I shared it a lot. It was actually research done in 2006 on a friend of mine's property in the Hawke's Bay in New Zealand. And what they're looking at here is across a hedgerow um, is same soil type right next to each other, conventional or integrated systems on the left, and then the biological regenerative, whatever you want to call it, on the right. So on the left, they are not using compost, which would be normal, right? So they're going to put urea down or whatever. They're going to herbicide underneath those trees. Um, they then need irrigation, right? So they're going to need to be able to irrigate to grow those trees. Whereas on the right, um, he was using compost and a little bit of agricultural lime, so uh, calcium limestone. Uh, he was not needing to irrigate and he's sequestering in that top fin four inches significantly more um, carbon in terms of pounds. Well, it could be a per hectare, per acre, per yard, doesn't matter, all right? So significantly more carbon in this environment on the right than on the left. Now, what's cool, I absolutely love this next slide, is what they did is they got um, an x-ray machine, basically. It's called the tomography machine, but it takes x-rays of the pore spaces. So what you're looking at here on the left is the integrated conventional type setup. And what's black is the soil and what's white is the pore spaces, right? So if you look at that soil on the right, it actually has more air in it than it has soil, right? And that air means that we can, that water can move right through this whole soil environment um, unimpeded basically. So when you, when you get a heavy rainfall event, if you can imagine on the left-hand side, the water just sits on that surface and then it pulls off and it runs off. The soil on the right, when you get, um, let's say they put in a liter, so that's a quarter of a gallon, poured that water through that top. And then when they measured what came through the bottom, only 600 mils. So two thirds of that water came out and the rest of it was just held in this whole matrix, right? And the other thing of this matrix is when it does rain, that that water slowly percolates through it goes side to side you got all this capillary action and so it slows that water movement down but that also means it slows it in terms of it evaporating uh, from the top so we slow it on both ways um, they also put some 2,4-D on because that's what scientists like to do the soil on the right if you apply 2,4-D what it does is it just runs off down into your waterways and uh, if you're in the in Australia this is what's killing the Great Barrier Reef. 2,4-D's been one of the ones they've really pointed to. When they put it in on the right and measured it they found no 2,4-D no so they're like oh, all right what idiot forgot to put the 2,4-D on and they did it again no 2,4-D and they they measured what was happening and what was happening in the soil is what we call um, bioremediation is basically the biology in there are taking it into their bodies or they're breaking it down into its component parts so it no longer becomes a problem in the environment but we need to have a soil that looks like this one on the right um so yeah just just to walk on these soils is amazing it feels like we even had this happen on um some of the vineyard soils that we we're working on that really high gravel as you're walking on them and they're spongy underneath your feet it's a really interesting feeling um, and if you go back into a lot of the like early colonial records of people going into Australia and into the US, they reported the same thing was just these soils were these incredible spongy. So when they had these very narrow wagon wheels, they just couldn't get anywhere because the wagons would get bogged down until they started to create these corridors that they could then drive on. But um, this is part of that rehydration of our landscapes is we want to have a soil that's not 50% minerals and 50% air and water. It's nearly, in this case, it was 78% air and water in that soil environment. So this is the con total connected space of the conventional. And really it's probably gonna be something like a grasshopper or um, a grass grub or some kind of pest insect is what's living in there. And then this is what it looked like in terms of what was the total connectivity and so 80% of that is all connected no limitation for air or water movement so absolutely a critical part of what we're doing so when we think about um, that soil functioning as we start to increase and so carbon uh, you know that's something that's lived before that could be plant roots or exudates or manure or urine or all the different things 
that when they break down and we no longer really know what that material is, um, that's what we we term as humus, but it's this building the soil carbon is what's holding on to a significant amount of water. So 24,000, that's not interesting, liters, 24,000 gallons an acre or 144,000 liters there. Yeah. Sorry, I got halfway through that slide and must have got, someone must have called me, I got confused. All right, so 24,000 gallons an acre or 144,000 liters per hectare. I want you to imagine that. And so through a, through the whole year, we get a wetting and drying cycle. So this is at one time. And so this wetting and drying cycle, this amount could actually be three times that amount, right? That we have in terms of water storage. So in a square yard, um, it's the equivalent of 75 liters. So three buckets of water in terms of water storage, right? So what we've lost in most of our environments um, is the soil carbon and it, it has a significant cost in terms of our water storage capacity. So think in a typical environment, most ecosystems have lost between 30 to 60% of their soil carbon. And it depends where we are in the world, but this is kind of a byproduct of modern agriculture is that we've lost our carbon, we've lost that water storage. Um, these soils should be operating like a sponge. So I want you to think about all of this microbiology. So it's just heaving with microbes, right? And 95% of all of the species on the land live underground right and those bodies are made typically over 70 percent anywhere between 70 to 90 percent of those microbes is made up of water part of that water can be released um, into the plant in a process called rhizophagy which i'll show you in a second and 30 to 60 percent of those nutrients coming into the seed come from the absorption of those microbes at the root tip um, and those microbial cell walls themselves it's a peptidic diglycan which is made up of sugar and amino acids which is called murin but basically these little these little microbes that are responding to the carbon that you're feeding um, or your really good soil management or your lifting plant photosynthesis those microbes are responding to that stimulation and they'll be breeding up really really rapidly and all of those little cell walls we basically got an amino acid and sugar full of water right so that microbiology are just teeming away and then this is the rhizophagy cycle so basically as that root expands down into the soil environment and this can this can happen from the moment that a seed germinates there can be microbiology inside that seed so those microbes will enter actually enter into what we call the plasmic spaces so basically they will enter into that cell membrane at that um, apical meristem, so where that root tip is expanding. So the biology comes into that, so that's bacteria and fungi. And then the plant does this really cool thing with basically it, it explodes those cell walls. Um, all those cell walls can actually just leak and it's an enzyme that they're calling NOx, but um, some of that bacteria can actually survive. So as it's exploding those cell membranes, it's absorbing that um, the nutrient and the water that's inside that bacteria and then those bacteria or um, fungi that are still survive this process they basically irritate that um, root tip and they form root hairs so this root hair formation actually happens in relationship with with microbiology it doesn't happen without microbiology which is fascinating um, so they they run out of nutrients so they exit out into that soil environment they start to reproduce and then they recharge themselves with nutrients and water and then they enter into the cell wall again and they're, they're blown apart by, by the roots. So um, James White and there's other researchers that have been looking at this is just really, really cool research to show the importance that, and I know Elaine Ingham says, has said this and there's a lot of scientists been saying it for a long time, that all you need is microbiology, right? Because it's the plant is supplying that microbiology with um, sugars and fatty acids and, and all sorts of secondary metabolites. Um, but the, the plant's not necessarily the one that's getting the nutrients. The nutrients and water are coming through this relationship with microbiology, right? They, are, they have the ability to um, release bound nutrients in that soil environment. So the magic of mushrooms, I love fungi, they're so cool. <laughs> Fungi do so many awesome things, but one thing they can do is they can make their own weather, which is really cool to think about. So they, 
they release water vapor um, off that, off their surfaces. And what it does is it creates this localized convention, um, convection, which lifts their spores and helps their spores move through that environment. So if you ever notice like there's a real moistness wherever we see fungi grow, and it's not just because fungi need moisture, which they do need, but they also help to rehydrate soils. So if, you, if your soil gets super dehydrated, and I see some of you are in environments where you do get really dry, what fungi are able to do is they can survive in that super dry and they have the ability to move in, right down through that soil profile and bring water from deeper down, but also from inside those soil aggregates. So inside the crumbs where it would be protected and maybe not as available to the plant, they can actually redistribute that right through that whole soil environment, which is amazing. All right, so one of the things that we see pretty much in, in our sampling everywhere is that most properties do not have enough fungi. They do not have enough active fungi or fungal biomass, all right? And so sometimes we can see soils that are really high in fungi, but they're not active, all right? So increasing that activity is absolutely a vital part of the water story. Something that you might see in some of these um, more semi-arid dry environments, um, and I, Actually, we see this even in, in wet environments is we can get surface crusting. Um, so this crust starts to develop and then we're gonna get really poor um, airflow. We get soils that start to become water repellent and you get um, things growing like your moss or your lichen. This image on the right is of cryptogams, these grasses in between, but the cryptogams are like your bryophytes and your lichens and your liver mosses, like really, really primitive stuff. But what they do is they actually create soils that become water repellent. And we're now in this really, really vicious cycle. So I think something like 50 million acres in Western Australia now have this water repellency. Um, and, and it's becoming an increasing problem, right? And what we see in these soils, very, very bacterial dominated, very, very like zero um, fungal activities. Um, there may be fungi in there, but they're not active. So we need to think about, well, what causes these non-wetting soils? And what you find is when these soils become super dry and super hot, um, is the bacteria that are there make a waxy coating and they'll coat those surfaces to protect themselves. Um, we also see non-wetting soils where you have a lot of um, what they call volatile organic compounds from um, decaying organic matter, especially things like um, gum trees or eucalyptus. Um, there's a lot of tree species that create these non-wetting environments, right? But you've got to look at, well, why are my soils not holding onto water? Why are they repelling water? Literally, hydrophobic means that they are afraid of water. We do not want soils that are afraid of water. So what we've discovered is that there are specific types of microbiology that will break down these waxes. So there's a Ceratia species, Pseudomonas, Actinomycetes. Some of you are probably familiar with Actinomycetes if you're doing compost. Um, bacillus, which is kind of everywhere, old bacillus. Um, but these organisms will specifically break down these waxes. Where do these organisms come from? They come from a worm's butt. So uh, this is where vermicast I find is really powerful as a tool to break down these waxes. So um, I sometimes think of like um, worms creating the elixir of life out of their bottoms, all right? So what they poop, is really what, what plants need um, ideally in terms of vitamins and enzymes and plant growth hormones and this type, these types of microbiology that is so essential for plant health. Um, I just want to share these images. This is from Kim Deans, who's one of the members of Integrity Soils based in Australia. She's been practicing regenerative uh, management for 14 years on her property, um, her, her and her husband. So grazing management, uh, you know, so long, long, long recoveries, good impact. Now this photograph was taken uh, last summer. They had a massive fire um, the January before. So this area is called Tinga. They were in the news because this fire was so big. The fire came through and everyone was like, well, so much for your regenerative stuff. You guys had more to burn. So what we're looking at here is the fence line between their place and the foreground and the neighbors on the right. And what I want you to notice is that the dust stops at their fence line and this dust went on for weeks and we saw some of the biggest dust storms coming out of Australia these this dust movement is not natural these huge big dust storms are not natural and we're seeing this all through the U.S. at the moment this is a sign that your microbiology are not working it's 
fungi that hold soils together and even if you were to cultivate those soils and there's still good fungi in there we see soils that don't move um so th this dust phenomenon is definitely a man-made phenomenon and then these guys were super excited when they got rain but notice that the rain uh the flooding stops at the fence line so you can see those fence posts are all burnt but the water infiltration is not happening at all on the neighboring property, whereas on their property, except for areas that were burnt really hot, that water's going in immediately. So the benefit of having a regenerative program before something like a fire means that you're going to have a quicker recovery and you're going to see higher successional species being able to germinate in these environments. But I, I love these fence line images. I think some of the best ones I've seen. So climate is out of our control. But there are things that we can do on a small scale, you know, and, and things are getting increasingly scary um, and increasingly seems like things are out of our control, but there is stuff that we can we can do. This photograph, this was in the Hawke's Bay where I have been living six years ago. This photo was taken in 2010. Um, Hawke's Bay was declared a drought. I don't know if you can see that picture. I can't because I've got bright light because I'm outside. Um, but most of New Zealand was uh, declared a drought. So it was all brown instead of green, which normally New Zealand would be all green. So this is uh, this was typical of what we were seeing. Um, and then this image here is from Dean Martin, who's practicing um, regenerative grazing management, adaptive grazing, um, diversity, uh, longer recoveries. And what you see is how green it is in there and how much feed he had. So while people started feeding out at the beginning of November, he didn't start feeding his cattle until the end of March. So we're building in that buffer in terms of um, being feed for livestock. So there's lots of things that we can do. Um, and also um, just consider, like I haven't really talk, touched on it and we can touch on it as we get into some quick Q&A, but um, these water cycles, microbiology play an essential role in terms of there's microbiology in actual particles. Like, so as the plant breathes out the stomata, there's actual microbiology that are in that, that can uh, then form rain clouds and then fall as rain. Um, some of these microbes, they get onto leaf surfaces and they can change the humidity. Uh, and many of those ones I mentioned with vermicast, they're changing the humidity of that leaf surface and they can reduce that drought susceptibility. Um, you guys have done a great plug, so I don't need to do too much of a plug, but grab my book. And um, if you're not much of a reader, then I really encourage you to, to get the audible version, but i um, happy to go to your Q&A. Nice. That was, I really like seeing that, that fence post image. That's so cool. Just seeing one space of land, water infiltrated down the other it was almost like this hydrophobic landscape that the water just sat on top. Mm -hmm. and I think that's, yeah. that's so crucial. That's so amazing to see that. Cause I know like people are going to might after fires are going to experience that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. All right. So we're going to go Q and a now, but really quick, I want to show some opportunities that you can learn from uh, Nicole. Let me just share the screen real quick. So, well, First stop before I do that, I gotta, I gotta do a shout out to your book. Yeah, like the love of the soil. It's it is such a good read. Like I went through the this, you know, all the soil food web classes, but this this book, like some soil books are dry. This one is, is really, really interesting. Like every single page will just suck you in because it's it's a lot of really practical information. Like like every every page I have here is marked up. It's just, it's just that, it's that good. Um, and so why don't we do, and also Nicole all, has some really great courses too. Like she's launched an online soul course, a, uh, a master class. You can buy her book here and she's about to launch a horse course. Yes, I'm excited about the horse May. course. That's exciting because people who are, you know, like my mom has horses in Colorado, you know, a lot of people are ranches. Those pastures are just beat up. So yeah. if, if there's a way to keep pastures healthy, that's an incredible thing. Like horse pastures are some of the most degraded places anywhere. Yeah. So I'm I'm excited to see what that course is all about. And you can, mm -hmm. you know, put into practice what you've learned in this webinar and expand it with Elaine, uh, with Nicole's uh soil courses. So she has a uh, a master class and she has a foundation course. 
which yeah. kind of goes into her practical practical which approach the, to soil restoration. We call it the read your soil like a pro. It's um like all the management, like what what should we be benchmarking? How do we know if we're moving forwards or backwards? Like how do we even know if our soil is is healthy? And so it's a really practical one and it's super fun to do with kids. Like we do some things like make a Burley's funnel. So like look at how many insects have you got? Like on a ranch that I'm working on, we counted 700 dung beetles in one cow pie. 700, I've got a, I've got a video of it. It's crazy. Um, yeah, so that stuff's super fun just to, to take a look for yourself. Cool, yeah, and I will, I'll post the link to that in the uh, chat box and in the email that everybody's getting afterwards, I will share that as well. Uh, so in the meantime, Zach, how about you, do you mind uh, sharing the, the thread screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, yep. And that was just awesome, Nicole. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, you did such a good job of relating how how important the soil is because it's, you know, it's what's ultimately covering the earth and what's managing the absorption of that water. And we see all of these problems that stem from poor soil management, but so rarely do we actually bring it back to that root cause of the issue. You know, we try and solve the algae blooms and we try and solve the erosion waterways and we try and solve the flooding when really it stems from this point where the raindrop hits the soil. And you did just such a good job of, of bringing home, you know, the key factors there. Um, so kind of stemming off that one first question for you we have a land with a gully from a creek that dried a few years ago going through the property we were wondering for this creek and if planting a willow tree could help huh. there's all these context specific kind of questions i guess and, and we really need to um you know you guys this is this like some of these eroding gullies is where the mechanical thinking is really helpful. I mean, that's potentially where I would do you know, your leaky weirs, um, the artificial beaver dams is what they call them out here, uh, which is what you guys specialize in. So, you know, being able to slow water down because just trying to plant a tree, you're going to find, especially water loving trees, they're not going to, they're going to struggle because it's a chicken and egg thing. I mean, you kind of need to slow that water down first. So look at why have I got this eroding gully? Is it something to do with my management? Um, is there something happening with water that's already moving across that landscape? And so I, I, I kind of address those things as on a landscape base in terms of we want to be, we want to build that sponge so we don't kind of have this mass flash flood and then drought and flash flood and then drought. Um, your soil should really be holding onto that water, but um, I need to see pictures, you know, I need to kind of visualize it. And I think um, Zach is probably better to answer that question. Well, you know, I would uh, kind of say the same thing in that we can, we can do these mechanical, you know, there's ways to intervene in the water courses that can really help as a more immediate solution, but also you really need to address how the water is hitting that landscape as a whole. And it reminds me of a project we both know, Jilla Matong with Martin Royds, where he's really doing these two things together. And all yeah. of the great projects that I see, they're doing these two things together. They're treating the waterways and they're treating the catchment area. And so when I was there, it was at the peak of this long drought, Braidwood was running out of water. He was offering up water because he still had water leaving his property years into a long drought. And when they got a half inch storm, none of his water bodies came up at all because that soil just absorbed everything. So whereas other places were actually even flooding in that rain after this long drought, he didn't even have his waterways impacted at all because it all just soaked into that soil. Like you were saying, it moves through that airspace and it trickles through to these waterways in the way that the landscape's more evolved and adapted to manage it. Uh, so a question about clay soil compaction from irrigation. Uh, we've had our small farm for almost 10 years. Our soil is extremely dense clay, California Bay Area. In the past couple of years, even with extensive cover cropping and keeping soils fully covered with live plants and guilds, we ended up with a 10 inch top layer of almost concrete hard clay. I'm wondering if this is the result of so many years of drip irrigation. We try our best to do no-till, but the crust is so hard we can't get seeds or seedlings into it without breaking it up. Suggestions? 
Well, it's kind of interesting to say that they've had, they've kept it fully covered with live plants. So how did those live plants get going? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a little bit of a background in, in working in the California area. So I know that, um, so if you, if you get hold of the book, there's a process that we work through, which is what we call the five M's. So which one of these is the driver behind soil health? So is it my mindset? Is it my management? Is it minerals, microbes, or organic matter? So those five things all drive compaction, for instance, or soil health. Um, and what we see in the Californian area is instead of having this huge big bank account of calcium, you guys have about 20% calcium. Calcium is critical for forming aggregates. If we don't have very, if we don't have adequate calcium, then it's really hard to get some of these systems going. So what we've been doing is actually putting um, different types of liquids or liquid calcium down the drill when we're actually seeding. And then because it's expensive to treat the whole area, but if we can just affect what's that plant experiencing, it's plants that build soil, right? So if we can just influence that little shoot, that root as it's, as it's dipping down um, and make sure it's got adequate calcium, then that's going to make a difference. But um, yeah, you could look at your irrigation water if you thought potentially that was a problem, but you need to figure out what is my limiting factor here. And what I think you'll find is your limiting factor is actually minerals in this case. That's fantastic. And kind of piggybacking off of that, another question someone had asked um, from Southeast Queensland in Australia, they wanted to understand how to go about finding out which of the five M's is the limiting factor and what mm -hmm. to be looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think this applies to every environment, not just um, Southeast Queensland um, is so with the five M's, then we look at that in terms of like mindset, you start with yourself. And if you're not sure, then, you know, asking your best friend or your husband or wife, do you know, like, do you think it's me? <laughs> do you think that's why things aren't going as well as they could? Um, having a look at your management, like, um, is it because I'm not allowing adequate plant recovery or am I working these soils when they're wet? You know, asking those questions of yourself and then to, to figure out about minerals we need to do. So what we do is we do soil mineral testing, soil microbial testing. We do plant tissue testing and we actually increasingly are doing animal like animal hair analysis um, and have a look at what is happening here in terms of trace elements or major minerals. Things like organic matter um, depends on your soil type, but like take a look at, you know, how much organic matter have I actually got in here or dig a hole start looking, bringing in all, your, all of your visual diagnostics as well as the, the soil testing. So we say that, you know, the testing is probably only 5% of our consideration. The rest of it is digging holes, looking at animals, looking at plant health um, and, try and, and try and work that out. But yeah, um, those tests are really important trying to figure it out. Yeah, that's fantastic. One question that, that I've been curious about as well. Um, someone who's intrigued by using seawater as a soil amendment. On the face of it, it seems counterintuitive to apply a saline product to our soil, knowing the damage salts do to microbes and plants. However, having read a little bit about Dr. Maynard Murray's work and your mentions of its use and seeing mentions of it elsewhere in Regen World, it obviously works in terms of plant health and growth. Is there a recommended safe limit of seawater used per hectare per year? I'm guessing we would not want to use each and every year for a period of time. Otherwise, we would see buildup of salinity. Has anybody studied the effects on soil biology? Uh, so there's quite a few questions in there, but um, I love sea minerals. I love seawater. We've used them a lot. Um, I had a I had a client, not a client. He just was a phone call phone hotline he gave me a call and we were doing some diagnostics and he's like I mentioned seawater and he was like okay thanks for your time and he was kind of got off the phone and he said you've just solved a family mystery for the last seven years this field consistently grows more grass we can graze it two or three times the cattle come out of there looking amazing well seven years ago they'd had a fire and they'd had monsoon buckets of seawater dumped on those fields so he went back and started applying seawater i know people that have applied like 100 gallons an acre or a thousand liters a hectare of seawater and see like a slight burn and then it kind of takes off if you're worried about this is like you hear these stories of salting the fields by the romans to for them to be able to have 
salted those fields, they would have had to have put on about 20,000 pounds or 20,000 kilos a hectare or 20,000 pounds an acre to create that salting effect. So um, uh, unless you have alkali um, or you already have high sodic soils, um, sea minerals for me feel always like a good option. I have a general rule of thumb, which is if you're already over two and a half percent base saturation sodium, then don't use it. Um, and then we leaf tissue test to have a look at what's happening in the leaf. And if you're over 0.6% sodium in the leaf, then don't use it. But what I find is because it's so soluble, it's actually a nutrient that most properties need. And the reason that it's not considered in traditional agronomy is because it's not an essential plant growth element, but it's essential for life. So microbiology need it just like you need it, just like a horse needs it. Um, so I find it's a critical one. And because it increases the, um, uh, the electrical conductivity in a soil, it increases plant growth, just kind of like urea is. So do some, do some trials. If you're never quite sure about some of this stuff, just give it a try for yourself. That's a really long question. Can you summarize it quickly without reading it all? This next one. I'll go to the one on the bottom, yeah, Adam. Okay, so the soil infiltrate, so he's in, he's in Hawaii. On, in Maui, really high rainfall area. It says our salt infiltrates at 12 inches per hour when doing a test. Uh, most rains soak in. And he says he gets about 60 to 80 inches of rain. Uh, is this over, I'm guessing over a year. Do you have any knowledge of the types of soils, climates to recommend So, so in areas with extremely high rainfall, like Hawaii and Maui, how do you how do you approach the mat, like the capture of of rain in extremely high rainfall environments? Like, how do you go about that situation? Oh, I That's kind of what I'm inferring from. Sounds from this like question. it's moving. You know, if it's infiltrating. Uh, and, and it's working like a sponge so we haven't got water sitting around then what's the problem uh, yeah I, I i think that kind of goes to if it's not broken you don't have to fix it and so if you if you have a functioning soil that's absorbing the water that has plenty of air you're in a great situation and be thankful yeah. and don't abuse it <laughs> i think that's a good point you know and you think of areas like hawaii and the west coast of new zealand you know they've they haven't had the such a long history of industrial agriculture, although we see some stuff obviously happening in Hawaii. Um, and, and then being thoughtful about the type of things that you're going to be doing in those landscapes. So not running giant big cattle, you know, like really thinking what's, what's going to work well in this, in this space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Steve's question here is, um, he's heard John Kemp talk about uh, crops growing with little or no nitrogen input and discoveries about plants other than legumes also fixing nitrogen and is wondering, uh, what are some of the most recent discoveries for non-legumes fixing nitrogen? And additionally, are there applications that introduce the right soil biology naturally or through a commercial product? What are the best ways to prime these uh, systems so to speak if you if you look in the literature these discoveries of free living nitrogen fixes is not new research at all so it's been well known for a long time in the literature anyway um that you know if you have a soil that's functioning the most common organisms are going to be like your frankia species or your azotobacters or things that are free living nitrogen fixes um, but what happens is if you're applying nitrogen, then those things disappear out of the system. And then you've got to kind of earn the right to get your, you know, pull your nitrogen and have that system start to restore. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think this is where good compost and vermicast are really helpful. If you have got a history of abusing land, maybe, or high nitrogen use, just to, to reboot the system. And these species are commercially available as well. Um, there was some cool stuff that was discovering that I can't remember the name of it, but it was um, they were finding corn plants that actually have a relationship with a symbiotic bacteria, um, nitrogen fixing bacteria, um, even though it was 
corn. So I think we're going to see more and more of those sort of endophyte species, different types of organisms that are living in symbiosis. Um, there's some really cool stuff around what we call entomopathogenic. So I, I'm sure scientists just do things like that on purpose to feel really smart, but entomopathogenic fungi. So they are, they live as endophytes. So that means they're living inside the, inside the cells of that plant um, in its root system. They grow this, their fungal hyphae out into the soil environment and then they infect into a into a insect and when they kill that insect they suck that nitrogen and bring that nitrogen back to the plant and if you think of um you know insect pests really as being the nitrogen thieves in an environment so a plant might have four percent nitrogen but a uh, insect's got 16 percent so they're just jam-packed full of nitrogen so if you've got these beneficial fungi that will actually increase the nitrogen um, in soil which is really cool that's fascinating. I've never heard that before. Um, so we've got a question here um, from Walter wondering about differences in water quality. He's He's got a long four month dry season. He collects his rainwater, but then that runs out and then he switches to well water. And he's wondering um, if these two different water sources have an influence on the soil biology in the forest loam, and is there anything you should be concerned about? Um, it's a really good question, and it is something that people need to be looking at um, and thinking about, uh, because we see. I'm finding that some of the biggest problems we're seeing on properties is actually because they have a hard water supply. Um, that's actually, if you think hard water is actually hard on plants and it's also hard in terms of flocculate um, like dispersing soils so we get these crust soils that form crusts so it is something to look at and think about and then look at are there ways if you are using a water that's very hard so we've seen this for ourselves but over about 150 parts per million hardness is going to have an impact on soil and on microbiology um, so just thinking about the quality of what you're irrigating, you know, and it could come back to, you know, maybe you've got high sodic soils, high sodic conditions in your water as well. So, and I see interesting things that, that the problems actually people's irrigation. So test your water and then think, are there different types of, you know, reverse osmosis or, um, structuring water, or we've got some people now that are running water through humates which means it's going to be stained. So you've got to watch that, but um, those humans are really effective at pulling stuff out. So yeah, test your water. And that's a, that's a fantastic answer. I totally agree. Reminds me of a project I, was, I learned in early on where uh, he has this ecosystem greenhouse that for 35 years, actually 40 now, no inputs, no amendments. He's just been working with this concept of perpetual soils and when he was first starting out, they told him you have to use well water. It has the nutrients and your system will fail if you don't. When in actuality, he didn't believe them. He just used rainwater. And if he had used well water, his system would have failed. He watered one of his rhododendrons once with well water as an experiment and it didn't flower for the next five years because it was so shocked. Um, yeah. So having yeah. some knowledge of the water qualities walter in washington state you're in one of the better areas if you're it depends on how central you are but if you're in the cascades and you're in those basaltic formations you typically have quite low hardness in your water but for most of the world that's a huge issue and something to be very aware of mm -hmm. Uh, next question from Rod. Uh, there are many fermented biofertilizers that can be made. Which form do you recommend to help build the soil structure, presumably with a fungi stimulating event? Question mark. Some biofertilizers are anaerobic, some are aerobic. Uh, does the soil structure need both anaerobic and aerobic elements to build a vibrant living soil with good absorptive structure? And how do they function differently? Mm, yeah, that's a really good question. And it's one that I've had for myself for a while too. But um, I personally like a lot of the natural Korean farming and have used that for a long time. I'm a massive fan of vermicast, if you haven't caught that jive. So, you know, I think no one does it better than a worm. Um, so using uh, vermicast as we're doing seed dressing, seed coatings, um, we're dripping it down with seed, we're doing... Um, even I've got some guys that actually putting 
Burma cast into their irrigation ditches. So dropping bags, burlap sacks into the irrigation ditches, like any opportunity to kind of get Burma cast out, I'm all about. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, lactobacillus, uh, the EM, the effective microorganisms, a lot of those organisms are um, facultative. So even though they might be um, grown in an anaerobic state and we might be using them for anaerobic conditions like um, settling pond and dairy or whatever, because they're facultative, they can actually switch to an aerobic phase as well. And what's been really interesting is to see the effects of, let's say a worm extract on mycorrhizae. So even though the worm extract itself doesn't contain any mycorrhizae, uh, we've seen massive, like over 200 to 300% increase in mycorrhizal colonization, even though there's no fungi in there. So it's kind of, you're setting the scene with all these different types of quorum signals, the secondary metabolites that are contained in diversity. So that's why I love um, a super, um, diverse um, compost or some material like that is that it's providing just this huge array of these secondary metabolites. Um. Fantastic. Um, yeah, another question here about what are your opinions on using the soil key renovator or the Yeaman's key lime plow for improving the soils? Uh, they seem to have good results with helping increase the carbon levels uh, if you were to use a soil key, what annual plants would you be planting? Um, I, like with a lot of things, you know, if we're going to be putting in, if we're going to be putting in cover crops, we're seeing that a couple of years of annuals is often what's required before you kind of get the right to put in perennial systems. What species is going to um, very much depend on your ecotype? Um, I want to see as much diversity as possible. I want to have some plants that are maybe really good at liberating phosphorus, for instance. You know, that might be some buckwheat or some lupins. I want to have some that have massive taproot systems. Um, I want the fibrous roots like oats, you know, oats and barley and, you know, those traditional kind of cropping plants um, do a great job uh, in, in terms of getting some diversity into the system. Um, but uh, there was a first part to her question. What was, there was something else in there. Yeah, your opinion of the soil key renovator or the Yeaman's key line plow and using it for improving soils. Um, I, I have, I've been invited to go and have a look at the soil key and I've just ran out of time every time. So I don't know, but a friend of mine, Adrian, who was involved in doing the carbon testing out there, she, she was really impressed and so, it kind of goes against a lot of the ethos in terms of like, here's a massive amount of cultivation. And, um, but that incorporation of all that organic material and then, you know, getting really good grazing management on top of that and getting diversity. I think they, they are getting the results. Um, I don't know how broad scale application it would be. Um, and I'd be interested to see how long this carbon is there for. Um, because some of this carbon is what we call, I'm here for a good time, not a long time, honey, which is the cycle that, you know, bacteria are really going to get in on that stuff and chew it up and then release it over time. So it would be interesting to see how long that carbon lasts for. So that would be some of my questions. Yeah, I think there's an interesting push and pull in that, in the steady disturbance is a really destructive bad thing but sometimes mm -hmm. disturbance is a really good thing i know this project yeah. i was just listening to a story last night about a project that we worked on we did acres and acres of earthworks and did not find one single earthworm we implemented mm -hmm. our water retention landscape we got cover crops going and now going back as we were planting fruit and nut trees we were cutting through earthworms with every single hole we were digging and this is just in four months you know a pretty yeah. night and day transition and it, it's because of that disturbance but at the same time we wouldn't want to do that every year or we start no. to run into a really destructive scenario that's right and i think there are cases where i can really think that that like intensive intervention is a great kickstart, um and then that wouldn't be something we would continue to do but yeah. Exactly. It's just the kickstart. And I oftentimes think of like the key lime plow or these other disturbance things as it can be a kickstart, not something you want to get dependent on doing every year. It's it's mm. just the means to an end. It's not the end itself. Yeah. 
Um, so this one's a little fun. Imagine there were unlimited human and financial resources to rehydrate, restore, regenerate the planet in the shortest time possible. What would be your primary areas of action? If we have unlimited financial and human resources, it's a really good question. Um, and I mean, we're seeing people doing this in in you know smaller areas. I guess um, I've been really excited about what I'm seeing on some of the extensive rangeland that I'm working on um, and seeing people, you know, are doubling their soil carbon in pretty short amounts of time just using livestock. So I think um, there's a mechanical solution in terms of let's slow what water down we do have. And if that involves the leaky weirs or the swales um, to, to really jumpstart, I mean, we've seen that obviously in places in, in China and uh, some of these big, big, big projects. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think if you can do that, then I would be using biosimulants, I'd be using plant diversity, I'd be using seed treatments, I'd be using livestock, I'd be using silviculture. I mean, we have all these tools. I mean, if, if everything is unlimited, but um, yeah, it's a, <laughs> anyway, it's a big question. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another question people have asked a couple of different ways. This one I, I shared while, well, we were getting you reconnected, um, just a system that I had seen as far as worm farming. But I know that Stuart here is asking uh, your guidance for scaling up a vermiculture system. Um, what would your ideal system look like? And then some other people had asked, what would be a good system on a home scale? Um, maybe someone with even just a suburban home or an apartment. Mm -hmm. um... So, the, I mean, to scale up worms is so easy. I mean, I, I, I think we, we try and, like, they shouldn't be labor intensive and we shouldn't be spending a whole lot of energy or money on these things. On the ground, I mean, they're just windrows. I mean, they're super simple. So just how long can you make your windrow be? I don't like those through flow systems. Um, I just think we're over mechanizing and you lose all the quality. So if we really want to increase fungi, we do that by not messing about stop touching them stop getting in there and fiddling like it's the static quiet stillness that that's where the fungi really flourish so leave it alone so that you, you get really good fungal diversity as well so there's there's no reason why we can't scale things what i found is um my old system had an indoor section and an outdoor section and i found that i could control the climate better in the inside and get a more consistent product um, but we're making massive worm farms out here in montana I'm in Wyoming right now, but in Montana um, that are just on the ground. As far as stuff for home, um, you know, round round bins are better than those square ones. Those square ones, you just really, really hard to manage. Like it's, it's like, why not give someone who doesn't know much about worms the hardest system to try and manage and then people kill all their worms and they hate worm farming. So get a round bin if you can. My mum used to have um, a pull out drawer under the sink. Um, that she had her worms in, you know, and had her worms right there. Uh, and, you know, if you manage them well, there's no reason why they'll smell or anything like that. So I find people don't give them enough paper and cardboard and carbon based um, complex foods. So that's, that's my main complaint with people in um, indoors trying to do with them is that they don't feed them enough cardboard or paper or wood chips or whatever you've got. So um, yeah, there's no reason why you can't do it on a small scale in the house for sure. Awesome. I, and that really mirrors what I said previously in that we were working for this worm farmer and he tried all the tubs and things and he just found windrows on the ground was the very best solution. Totally. Um, this question, I, I don't think there's really a clear answer to, but I think our discussion around it could help people understand better. Um, so if the goal is to restore the biotic pump effect and the landscape is more or less without trees, what width of planting of trees will be enough to work? in order to create the necessary updraft of moisture and raindrop gathering bits. And if clearings are needed in which to grow grains and vegetables, how wide can they be before they render the bands of trees ineffective? Mm -hmm. Really good. And I think, um, you know, the, this water story, the biggest part of it, I mean, the biggest part of climate change and all of it is water, all right? So water vapor, what is happening in terms of ground cover? So the desertification and the opening up of landscapes grasslands is really what's been degrading our water cycles. Um, uh, you know, we get the biotic pump 
and obviously a lot more vo volatile organic compounds from a diversity of tree species. So, um, you know, and the rabbit proof fence is a really good example of how that pump works and how it collapses when you don't have ground cover. Um, as far as width of planting of trees, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but yeah, this is where I'm a big fan of mosaic effects. You know, can we have alley crops? Can we, can we build more of a mosaic so we have um, these water systems working? Um, I'm just trying to read that. I don't know what you guys would add. I, I think that's spot on. And I think so many times people want to distill it to, we need a forest of this size to do these things. And it doesn't really work like that. Let's just start moving in a better direction. Let's start having more trees, more diversity in our landscape. You know, you can do things like Willie Smith's where you do it on 10,000 acres and you can really measure a 15% increase in your rainfall, uh, mm. but it doesn't have to be at that grandiose scale to also be effective. Yeah. And I think of Alejandro Carrillo down in the Chihuahua Desert um, and what he's doing just with grasses in terms of restoring water cycles and, and, and increasing precipitation. Like you can see a cloud formation happening over his property. It's really, really cool. You know, the worst thing that we can do is have bare soil um, because, you know, there's that vicious downward cycle and, you know, they've done some great research on chemical fallow, which I'm sure no one on this call is doing, but, you know, and, and, and that effect on that atmospheric boundary in terms of we are geoengineering and pushing clouds away, whereas what we need is just green cover. Um, and it, obviously we're going to see a lot more transpiration and see that effect in forests. Um, but in some ways that water's sort of cycling in that, in that environment. We want, to, we want to see all of these ecosystems restore. And so some people are actually in grasslands. They never had trees. There's probably never going to be trees. Um, and so not feeling like, hey, a forest is the end of the succession pathway because it's not. It depends on what is the bi biome that you're in, where does this landscape naturally tend to um, and just getting diversity of green living plants. Absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly agree there. You have to really consider where you are, the context of that place, the history of that place in making those decisions. Uh, next up, uh, any ideas of how to harvest or take advantage of heavy dew in a dry maritime climate? They're in the southwestern Clula coast of Portugal uh, with no rain between June and October directly at the ocean. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this effect, but like where you have like a bowl of sugar on your bench top and notice how quickly that bowl of sugar will get a crust on it. And that's water that that sugar is actually attracting. So one of the best ways that we can get water back into the system is through lifting plant photosynthesis. So that plant will, if it, if it has adequate um, or luxury levels of sugar, it's going to pump that sugar down through the root zone. And then it's, it's out in those roots as, a, as exudates and those exudates attract moisture out of even dry land environments. So to capture dew, we want as much diversity again as possible, different types of solar panels, different types of, of heights of, you know, in a Mediterranean climate, you know, we can have shrubs and trees and different, different species um, and then really be focusing on how do I build organic matter? How do I lift that sugar and get more sugar pumped down into the root system? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we can also have a meaningful impact on that dew itself in the ways that we retain water. You know, we can actually increase how much dew is being created on a landscape in addition to how the landscape is capturing it and storing it. So how um, would you increase that dew? Oh, water bodies. You know, we see so oh, yeah. much. We, ha we have these effects of the water bodies in the immediate areas and in the percolation through the soil. But then there's also really significant impacts just in the moisture going into the air and the amount of dew that you have around these water bodies. The, mm. the areas that are passively hydrated extend far beyond what I would have ever anticipated. Have you ever noticed the effect of the moon, like going outside? Oh, big time. Yeah. And in plant, you know, in the amount of water, even just as simple as cutting firewood, you know, it'll have a huge impact in terms of the amount of water in that wood and how long it takes to dry. Yeah. Yeah. My computer just went flat. 
So, but I've got my phone backup, so we're good. Nice. I like the backup <laughs> system. I was ready. I got the warning. <laughs> oh, funny. Um, so Elliot here has a question. Uh, 15 acres pastures with some very short rooted grasses, and he'd love to get deep rooted perennial glass grasses uh, for all the benefits they offer. But wow, is it hard to find information on what I can plant in my area? He's in the North Willamette Valley, uh, just south of Portland, Oregon. Oh, yeah. uh, the best he can do is annual rye, which seems to be more perennial there. Can I get yes. some pointers and information and sources on deep rooted grasses? I would actually talk to your local universities and go and talk to some paleobotanists because what we've seen out of the Californian region is how much diversity has become locally extinct due to management and there's so many um, perennial grasses uh, your bunch grasses your um, bluegrass your gamma grasses all of those that would do really well in your environment and so if you go and talk to the the paleobotanists they've done a lot of studies in terms of what used to grow in California and then go okay how do I find that seed and maybe you're not going to find it in California oh Portland sorry you're in Oregon um but uh, yeah, there, there's so much, so much available out there. Um, and I think, you know, looking at some of the native grasses, the native perennials, but this really comes back to what is the signal that we're sending in our soils? What are you managing for? And what we find is most people are not managing for perennials, they're managing for annuals. So looking at what am I doing that's meaning that the perennials are not germinating because the seed bank will sit there for you know decades and decades and decades until it gets a signal to germinate so whatever you see growing is a direct um, response to what you've been doing fantastic fantastic uh yeah building a little bit off of that is there a way to develop an intuition for what nutrients the soil may lack or have excess of uh I know understanding the local history of soil development and weather patterns helps, as well as using some weeds and indicator species, weeds mm. as indicator species. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting one in terms of how do we develop an intuition, because I think how much of my intuition is intuition and how much of it is the fact that I've done the research, I've looked at leaf tissue tests or mineral tests in these areas. I know that these are what these certain type of species like. Um, and so what I feel is my intuition is probably backed up by doing the testing. Um, and yeah, doing the testing and doing the testing and asking the questions and digging holes and, and building that, uh, learning to read patterns and landscapes. And so people when I'm out with people, they think I'm doing it intuitively. And it's like, well, some of it is, a lot of it is, but uh, you know, a lot of it too is, is, is just doing that testing. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. I find the same thing as the experience grows, so does your intuition and you mm -hmm. can't really pull them apart. I, I know this great story of a tractor tracker in the North with the musk oxen and he points out a track and says, that will be the one who goes to meet the wolves. And this white person asking how do you know that and he's just baffled by the question he says well because my dad told me that and his dad told him that and you know it's this passive tacit under tacit understanding that comes through practice again and again and again and failures and successes and then you start to feel which is which yeah uh, so this is a fun question as well um, when and where will these principles be taught in trade schools and or colleges can we come up with an elementary school curriculum to distribute and share? Is that something you've ever considered, Nicole? Um, I, I think those curriculums exist. So it's um, just connecting with the people that are doing it. Uh, I would reach out to Dee Dee Pursehouse, who wrote the wonderful book, The Ecology of Care, which I really recommend. And uh, she's done a lot with curriculum. Um, there are increasing numbers of, I guess, colleges now offering this. Um, I just, I mean, I think soil health should be taught from the age of two, the minute you can get in the garden. But um, yeah, uh, things are happening, just not as quickly as we'd like. Yeah. And piggybacking off of that, I know Matt Powers with the Permaculture Student does a good, a lot of good things. Um, I think that's more like middle school, high school ranges, uh, but he may have some entry and elementary school level stuff as well. 
Um, and I agree. I mean, that's something that every human should be learning from a young age. It would make better teachers, better politicians, better lawyers, if we actually understand the ways that these natural systems function. Really? Cool. All right, uh, real quick, we should, let's, we should, we can get to the end here pretty quick. How about let's do three more questions. And Nicole, that's, does that sound good to you? That sounds good. Yeah, I've got my, my riders come back up the hill to wait yeah, for me. Yeah, he's probably like, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, there's cows. one, like, uh, I see one by Charcoal Cam. I'll answer that question on the thread. I'll just post the section that she has in her book about the Johnson Sioux. But I think mm -hmm. there's there's one from Madhu Reddy about a, a question in Indian invasives and one mm -hmm. from Haven McBarnish about uh, wildfires. Uh, those are two questions I'd love to have answered. So why don't yeah. we go to Madhu Reddy first? Uh, okay. I, I can you share your, your voice is a yeah. little warbly there. So mm -hmm. Madhu says, could you share a little bit on how you use invasive weeds in dry and arid lands? Basically, uh, in, his, in her area of India, the, the grasses introduced during the Green Revolution are, are kind of taking over and they're, they're an invasive. Mm. Well, I mean, I guess it depends why. Why are they invasive? Are they poisonous? What are, what's the actual truly detrimental effect of? We're seeing, you know, some of these invasive species um, also have al al allopathic impacts in terms of what they're releasing out their root zone or the types of microbiology that they're feeding so they they can actually create environments around them that maintain the status quo that uh, it can be incredibly destructive in terms of especially if animals won't eat it or if they're if they're herbicide resistant um, in cropping zones but again it's asking those questions of you know are, are they trying to address a mineral imbalance are they really building soil carbon um, are they indicating microbial imbalances and then addressing it so that we don't have the conditions for those? Um, and then also maybe thinking, what is it, how would that plant exist in its natural habitat? Are we missing some kind of predator? You know, does it need a specific moth or a, whatever that would normally predate on it? Um, but we are finding we're getting some pretty good results just by changing soil conditions. Something that's quite fun to do as well is to make a weed extract. So, so get that weed, fill like a whole 200 liter or 50 gallon drum with the weed right up to the top um, and then put a big concrete block on it and just squish it. And it squishes down into something that looks like Marmite, which all you non-Australian New Zealanders won't know what Marmite is, but it's a sticky black kind of substance uh, and then dilute that and spray it back onto the weeds and what you've actually done in that weed extract is you're breeding up the pathogens for that particular weed and you're also concentrating the trace elements that maybe it's concentrating so you're doing it out of a job um, and we've had some great success doing that but um, yeah it's a multi-tiered approach really with all of this so looking at yeah what what are, what are those soil conditions and then how do we do it out of a job nice Awesome. Uh, do you want to, let's do this fire one, Raleigh. Yeah, that sounds good. So, so Haven asked in California, the government's approach to stopping forest fires is to treat plant life as fuel and tell homeowners to whack away. This leads to bare lands that get compact and where things are like highly flammable cheat grass and other invasives start to grow. If you were counseling a community on fighting fires, what would be your main point of advice? Mm. It's very good. And and I do. So we, we've been involved in a few fire recovery projects as opposed to pre-fire, I guess. We, <laughs> they get us in after they've had the, the problem. But what we're seeing really is that um, most of these um, forested ecosystems are not being managed as they would be managed naturally. This is a huge topic. I don't know if we can do that in a few minutes. Um, but the fire recovery is essential because we end up in a primitive um response which is where we get the cheat grasses we get some of these um, species that that love fire um, and we see this in Australia too you get these really dense um, growths instead of you know a natural growth forest where you're going to have the big mama papa trees and um, they're not going to have what they call the ladders on the bottoms you know so there's no kind of fuel underneath that makes these hot fires so it's really 
managing that fuel load and that might require you know goats and sheep and and grazing management or um cool season fires and you know the problem with california is people got all their houses in the middle of these forests you know and they don't want it to burn because they don't want the smoke and it's like well now you're building up a fuel load so really thinking about fire in terms of ecosystem function um and, you know, we see some beautiful soils in California that are the mola soils that were basically created by indigenous people with fire stick farming, like what they're doing in Australia. You know, some of these environments are ad adapted and evolved for fire. So they have plant species that only germinate when they have fire. Um, so really, yeah, we just, we need to go back to how would this have looked in nature? Um, it would have been a mosaic landscape. There would have been a lot of fire. And now we've gone and, we go and put our human needs all over the top of it. But yeah, sorry, there's no quick, quick answer. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. And and I totally agree. I think we're in this situation where with so many landscapes, we're either looking at fire or fungi. Are we creating the conditions where these biological elements can feed the fungal systems and feed the soil biology? Or are we creating these systems where they dry out and just form tinder? And then we're naturally going to get these mega fires. And, in so many cases, we've desertified these landscapes to this incredible degree. We've created these huge drainage systems, and then we freak out when the natural result is they become drier and burn more. Mm, totally. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you there. You know, and it's interesting to travel the world and just see how many of our forests are dying. Um, from pine beetle here to um, Phytophthora fungi in New Zealand. And, you know, also, I mean, it was... It was mind boggling to me to see in New Zealand, like the forest dying. And it's because all their nutrient cycles are broken down. All the water cycles are broken down. Um, yeah. And, and in some ways, I kind of feel like a lot of these environments are trying to return to a grassland ecosystem, which is bizarre. Um, but that's where they're heading. Um, and that might be part of nature's need to repair because instead of carbon being up in the atmosphere with a fire, the carbon gets down in the soil um, through grasslands. Sorry, that's kind of controversial, but it's just my... Hey, we're all about controversial here. <laughs> I'm like really ecologically triggered right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I needed a trigger warning. <laughs> I think that's a really good place to leave this, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, it's, it's such a big problem and... It, you know, there's, again, there's no one answer. We really need to look at the conditions we're working with. And, you know, there's so many positive ways. Like I think of Peter Marshall in Australia, he had fire burning around his place for two months and he was turning crown fires to ground fires. And it was all from his water retention, from his forestry development, from working with all the naughty plants, the willows and the popples. And they were actually creating fire breaks and retarding the fires as it entered. And because he had laddered up his trees, there wasn't any fire laddering. And he was able to put these fires out with a shovel for two months and all of his yep. neighbors burned, but he survived and is even thriving as a result of it. Yeah, and we see the same thing in New Zealand with native trees. Is the natives are the ones that don't really burn, but the exotics are the ones, you know, the eucalypts and the pine. So, you know, actually using native trees now as, as breaks for these massive plantings that they're doing of um, radiata and et cetera. Yeah, so just thinking back to nature, you know, how to nature manage fire through rehydration. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate this. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it was such a drama, but we worked it out. We're in the mountains. Ah, don't worry about it. I, I appreciate you like running, sprinting up the hill and getting set up with your laptop. You made it work, Nicole. We appreciate we did. it. <laughs> well, so, didn't get their questions answered. I'm sorry. Like Michael and, and Chuckle Sam and Mark and Susanna and Jens. Uh, well, thank you for posting. We'll try to answer it in the, in the way we can. But thank you, uh, we're going to post this replay. And Nicole, thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to uh, send out an email with all your courses and more about this webinar. Everyone's getting a replay. And thanks for awesome. tuning in, everybody. I, I hope you learned a, a bit about how you can infiltrate water, protect your soil, repair your soil, and, and help repair the water cycle. Hmm. And thanks, Zach, for guiding us along. Thanks, team. It's always a pleasure to be talking with you guys. Great job. Yeah, I learned so much and I'm sure everyone who joined will and 
or did. And, you know, this is going to be a resource for people continuing into the future. So thanks so much for helping us create this. Yeah. Thanks again. All right. We're